we are fine. Um, and it's recording. Yes. yes, we are ready. Great. Welcome, welcome everybody uh, to the second in the entire seminar series. Uh, last week we had Dominique Somda presenting her paper. Uh, this week we have Sanya Osha, who is a uh, humor's philosopher in residence and uh, senior senior researcher. And uh, Sanya is going to be talking about um, a paper that he's working on, uh, which is uh, the Niger Delta from Ken Sarawiwa to Boko Haram. And we also distributed a, a paper, an earlier paper um, by Sanya Osha, uh, which is on a similar on a similar subject. So we, we, we distributed a published paper that was published with Socialism and Democracy in 2016 called Aspects of Ken Sarawiwa's Legacy. Uh, so that was reading material for the seminar. And today, um, Sanya is gonna be talking about the paper he has in, in, in process. So um, just to tell you a little bit more about Sanya. So Sanya holds a PhD in philosophy and he's taught in Nigeria at, at Nigerian universities for a decade. Um, and he's published extensively on anthropology, cultural studies, and knowledge systems of Africa and the politics of the West African region. Um, and he's held many positions uh, in different parts of the world. Um, including here in South Africa at the University of KZN. And uh, he's, he's here at Humor working on the On Being Human research strand. And yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing um, what you have to say. Uh, and I was, I was reminded of, 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 of the day that Ken Sarawiwa was put to death back in 1995 and what a, a um, horrifying event that was because it was, uh, in, it was in, I was in South Africa, I was about 21 years old, and it was just after South Africa had attained democracy in 1994. And it seemed unbelievable that this could happen. It was, you know, his trial was televised around the world, and they executed a poet and a nonviolent um, activist. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a still a very, you know, sort of still a very real event, and his legacy is still very uh, vivid. So yeah, um, Sanya, would you like to take over? And Divine, perhaps you would um, transfer it to Sanya. I think you may be muted, Sanya. Yes, I was saying, um... Thank you very much, Ralph, for that very incisive and, and knowledgeable introduction. And um, yeah, it couldn't have been better. Uh, and I want to say good afternoon to all our colleagues who are present and appreciate your presence. And I look forward to a very lively and engaging interaction with, with you on uh, this um, project I'm working on, which I've, I've been working on for several years now, and I um, hope some, some of us were able to um, go through the reading material, that's the books, um, uh, sorry, the article I sent, and those of us who have my uh, book, the recent one on, on Ken Sarawiwa and the social protest movement, if you had time to look at it, I would help in, in, in the kind of conversations we'll be having today. Um, what I'd like to do today, this evening, is to talk about Ken Sarawiwa's place as a social activist, as the leader of the Ogoni protest movement, the what he achieved, the circumstances that led to his death, and the political context, the social political context that also um, informed his, his passing. After which, I'll go on to talk some more um, on the political landscape in Nigeria after you know, his passing, um, the set of um, contestations of the Nigerian state that has occurred since his passing. And what we would um, see is that things have changed quite radically 
um, drastically rather, things have changed drastically. There are new actors and there are new parameters of, of social activism and resistance to the Nigerian nation building project. Um, and what we'd also notice is that the forms of resistance and dissent pursued by Ken Sariwa, Wiwa and the Ogoni through their organization, which is the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, is much different from what is currently occurring under the auspices of Boko Haram. So those are the, the I want to explore the differences in approaches of these two social, one, one is, can be regarded as a social movement, that's a movement, and that's Mossop movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, and Boko Haram, which is widely considered to be um, a terrorist set. Now, um, that is what actually makes this sort of conversation a bit problematic. Problematic because it's, a, it's quite easy to stigmatize and demonize Boko Haram. And it would be interesting to find other ways to either humanize the sect or find reasons for their existence that are not glib in terms of yeah, demonizing or, and, and stigmatization. Um, so that, that is what I think is a, uh, uh, a huge challenge for, for researchers interested in this area of study. So now I'll begin my, um, my discussion by talking about Ken Sarawiwa and the Ogoni protest movement. Like Ralph said in his introduction, um, the culmination of the Ogoni protest movement was the um, hanging of Ken Sarawiwa and eight other Ogoni activists on November 10th, 1995. Um, his, uh, this, this generated a lot of outcry internationally. And what happened was that for a few years before the unfortunate incident, Ken Sarawiwa had been very active as leader and spokesperson of the Ogoni protest movement. I mentioned the, the movement as um, being um, the movement for the survival of the Ogoni um, people from henceforth would call, you know, it's Mossop. Now, Mossop was formed after a series of agitations in Ogoni land and the Niger Delta to fight for amongst other things, socioeconomic rights, environmental protection, and cultural you know, recognition or autonom autonomy. They wanted uh, a much more larger representation in the, within the Nigerian um, national space. They felt marginalized, they felt disenfranchised. Um, when oil was discovered in the Niger Delta in 1958 by Shell, a lot of multinational com concerns from Europe, from the US, from, uh, you know, and, and the de so-called developed world flocked to Ogoni territory and the Niger Delta and, um, generally where, uh, where oil was, to, uh, was found in, in, in great abundance. And they started a, um, an intense um, program of extraction, mineral, mineral extraction, gas and oil. And in doing so, a lot of um, environmental measures, protection measures were not um, adhered to, were not adopted. So you had oil spillages, you had pollution, pollution of the farmlands, pollution of the water courses, pollution of the rivers that devastated the entire territory. The, the entire territory, if you see some of the pictures emerging from that territory now, it's just shocking. Um, the place has it's more, it's something, it's so 
it's akin to dystop and dystopia. Um, something akin to the, the, the post nuclear holocaust or something, you know, bleak, bleak, devastated, no, no vegetation, a, pl a place that was um, previously um, blessed with all kinds of fora, vegetate, all kinds of and um, plant life, you know, and becomes so desolate. It becomes it becomes so desolate, so um, scary because um, that is what has happened after years of um, oil extraction, and so people in the Niger Delta started agitating. They were not um, usually not employed by this or in large numbers by this multinational multinational oil concerns, and they had no voice, no large you know, in significant numbers within the Nigerian federal space. And so they started to agitate for their rights, for better living conditions, for. Um, greater environmental sanity and for light for their livelihoods which were being destroyed livelihoods as farmers as fishermen you know and you know their land had become quite barren quite you know like i said desolate from um, the, the intense mineral extraction and even as far back as um, the 60s there were agitations by earlier activists like Isaac Boru, who was eventually killed in the Nigerian Civil War um, of 1967 to 1970. He was, was killed in, in the, uh, on the war front. But before then, he had been arrested for agitating for um, this sort of causes that Ken Saruwa came to represent. And so um, that was in the 60s. Ken Saruwa, mind you, did not start as an activist, even though he was very aware of the consequences of um, the um, intense mineral, mineral ex extraction going on in the Niger Delta, the pollution, the devastation of livelihoods, the environmental uh, degradation of the territory. He was very aware. But he started off, first of all, by acquiring these necessary skills, experience, and exposure to be able to launch a, a really effective challenge to the Nigerian State Federation. So what he did was that he got himself educated. He even worked for government. He worked, he was, um, as a young man, he was, became a, a, what you call a, a commissioner um, in, 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 in River State after, during, just after the war. So he had, he held very important positions in government. After that, he disengaged from government, went into business and then, um, became quite successful as a publisher, as an international businessman. And then that was when he thought, okay, I'm ready to start to pursue this cause of freeing my people. The Ogoni people, like I said, uh, were a minority within, or still a minority uh, within the, either if you look at it regionally, which is when, where they are in this, in this, in this south, it's called the south-south. But the region was grouped as being part of the eastern region, and where they were, they had very little voice. And um, Ken Sari, we, we were thought it would be now be appropriate after he'd acquired the necessary skills, resources, and contacts to launch um, his struggle for to em emancipate or at least uplift the lot of, of the Ogoni people. The Ogoni people then at that time was just the number, just half a million people. 
And so they were quite small within the Nigerian um, configuration. And the first thing he started to, the first thing they did was to mobilize their people, make them aware of what is happening. So there was a lot of um, consciousness rising campaigns which he was involved in. He had the resources now at least uh, relatively to um, uplift the consciousness of his people. He, for, he mobilized them and then he was very, very effective in drafting what was what is called the Oguni Bill of Rights, which was presented to the Nigerian government in 1993, the federal government. Mind you, all, during all this time, Nigeria was under the um, of, under the under military rule. That's a re, a rule by army generals. And it was quite a difficult situation politically because it, it was ruled by military fiat, military uh, decrees, and there was no um, space for public dissent. There was no space for um, deviation from the path of the military government. Any such deviations or challenge was viewed as treasonous and was also often met by very violent re and repressive reprisals. Um, agitations and resistance were um, promptly crushed and the perpetrators of such activities were often dealt with you know, in quite harsh terms. So it was quite a dang dangerous political context and quite difficult. Um, but nonetheless, Ken Sari were forged ahead. Like I said, the Ogoni Bill of Rights, which was um, quite, um, which was quite important in the as a watershed in the Ogoni struggle, was drafted, and he participated prominently in the drafting. The Ogoni Bill of Rights, like I said, was um, tendered to the military government, and some of the um, demands within the Bill of Rights was um, better environmental protection uh, measures for their territory, cultural autonomy, social and political rights, economic rights. So those are the sort of demands that were made to the government. Obvious, of course, the government at that time was um, um, the largely the government of um, General Sani Abacha, who was one of the most um, heinous dictators that ever you know ruled Nigeria. Sani Abacha, incidentally, had known Sarawiwa when they were both in, in government. When he was in government, that's uh, Sarawiwa. So they were actually quite friendly. He knew Sarawiwa knew him. And so I, I think that might have contributed to Sarawiwa's um, vocal activism. You know, he wasn't um, daunted or intimidated by the prospect of challenging this very um, strict and unforgiving dictator called Sania Bacha. But alas, he was wrong. He was wrong, as we, we know, we all know, because in, in 1995, he was hanged with, you know, and, you know, um, the movement was crushed. Before then, Sarawiba was involved with a lot of activities, both locally in, within Nigeria and abroad. He took his case to the UN, he took his case to several bodies, human rights bodies, you know, um, telling the world about the plight of the Ogoni people and the people in the Niger Delta. He wanted to form an association, he formed an organization for environmental protection at not only at the Niger, uh, national level, but at the continental level that looked, MROF, the organization is called, that would look at um, um, the plight of besieged um, 
regions and countries of Africa or place and peoples who are uh, under um, great environmental stress or distress, as the case may be. So he was very um, vocal internationally beyond the borders of Nigeria, going abroad, going everywhere. And so the world became much more aware of the plight of the Ogoni people and the Niger Delta generally. Films were made, reports were written, human rights organizations came, both from the UN and the Commonwealth of Nations. And so, you know, there was a lot of awareness eventually about the, what was going on in Ogoni land. This obviously made the military regime very uncomfortable. And like I said, eventually he was killed. He was put down. And under trumped up charges that he was um, promoting violence, that he was be behind the death, deaths of four um, former government officials in, 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 from the river state area of Nigeria where you know he also came from that's you know so they, he was trumped up charges charges that were never um, confirmed or proved forensically and on the basis of that that was why he was killed and he was killed in the most heinous manner which recalls the death deaths of um, Master Sergeant Doe of, of Sierra Leone we would recall that when Master Sergeant Doe was killed in 1990, he was, his killing was videotaped. First of all, what happened was that Master Sergeant, Master Sergeant Samuel Doe was, um, was stripped naked to his underwear. His hair, ears were chopped off. And then he was like tortured to death. He, he died a very um, terrible death, death, even though he had been a, a quite um, heinous dictator himself. And that occurred in, night, in Monrovia in 1990. The same two treatment was visited on, and this was captured on videotape. It was captured on video. The same thing happened when um, Saruwa died. There were Commissioners, it was a grisly scene. There were commissioners, there were important um, government officials involved. They were there, they were present. There were the, the judge that sentenced him to de death. It was like a kangaroo court. It, it couldn't have been otherwise because it was under a military regime and they were ruling by military fiat. And they were, the government officials were there. The judges were there, journalists were there, and it was captured, you know, and it was very quite surreal. It was uh, captured, uh, he, he, he eventually died after three grisly attempts, you know, to take his life because they kept get, get, getting, sorry, five grisly attempts to, to take his life because they kept not, uh, not getting it. And then he died, and he was buried hurriedly. Um, there were pro there were um, um, prohibitions for to, for any events or in, uh, events to mark his passing. No, um, no, there were no there were supposed to be no funeral uh, processions, no events to mark his passing. It was supposed to be hush hush. No one was supposed to talk about his death. Even the wearing of black clothes were were banned. And people in Nigeria felt this was akin to what was happening in South Africa at that time. Uh, you know, the repression was just so. Um, Inhumane, inhuman, inhumane, both, you know, and it, it, it did a lot of damage to the national psyche then. The government tried to erase the memory of Sekensa Wewa. The repression got uh, much more intense. There was a militarization of Ogoni territory. And all activists were hounded. They were hound. There was a, because um, some people were still active after Kensarua passed, and the eight other Ogoni activists were so um, activists were hounded. Um, 
a lot of people lost their property. Many were handed into jail. A lot of people were handed into exile. The US um, did take a lot of um, Ogonisit indigents as refugees during the time. There were, a lot of them fled to the US and neighboring countries. And in time, the Mosok um, splintered the energies that motivated them because they were quite active. They were, you know, most of had all their sub um, organizations, you know, women's organization, youth's organization, all kinds of organization, organizations under the umbrella of most of existed. A lot of them fell into disarray after the death of, of Ken Saruwa and then the repression that occurred after his death, the, there was the repression and then there was militarization of the territories. There was a clampdown. And this was quite effective because, like I said, Nigeria was under military dicta dictatorship. So that was what had occurred. And then um, Musop lost its momentum, unfortunately. Most of much lost his momentum. But what occurred, because after he passed in 1995, Nigeria returned to military rule in 1999. So that was a major event. By then, Mosop had lost most of his momentum. It was just, it was a shadow of its former self. But in its place, a lot of other insurgent groups had emerged in the Niger Delta, so many of them, all over, not necessarily within Ogoni territory, but in other parts of the Niger Delta. And they became quite vociferous in fighting for the same causes that um, Ken Saruba fought for, but using other methods, more methods that would, would be considered terroristic or terrorist. Um, they were much more vocal or, and much more brazen in their attempt to um, get their plight known. And they a lot of them resorted to criminal means. There was a vandalization. They, they became vandalization of oil pipelines became much more common. There were the kidnaps of foreign oil workers and even local workers. There was under the guise of fighting for their rights. So they resorted to a lot of criminality and they were, you know, demand, kidnap, rans, ask, demands for ransom. It became a, a sort of industry in the Niger Delta that it became also um, a cause for international concern. They were disrupting a lot of the activities of the oil companies. Some of them had to shut down the operations in places that were considered too dangerous. And it also bred, led to a culture of impunity within the territory because all these forms of lawlessness, kidnap, you know, vandalization of oil installations or whatever you was, were occurring in all these places. And so the dynamic changed. And how did it change? Because Mind you, Ken Saruwa never, he, he, he stood for the creed of nonviolence. He, 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 he um, valued democracy, he valued human rights, he valued the, he had value for human life, he had value for human dignity. And so all the screaming, because he, he was a quite educated man. He was a man of letters, mind you. He wrote novels, he wrote um, all kinds of plays, everything. So he was a very cultured man. And so this reflected in also in his activism. He wasn't a criminal like these other um, insurgent groups that emerged from the Niger Delta, which were much more um, shady in their methods and quite, um, like I said, criminal in their intent and methods. Um, that was what occurred. And that was also because of the intransigence of the Nigerian state and leadership and political leadership in not recognizing that something had to be done about the plight of the Niger Delta. There was utter neglect for many years. A region that had produced 
billions of dollars worth of wealth and um, worth of um, yeah of of resources for the country. You are suffering neg neglect, you know, and the, you know devastation in all forms, both in like I said, in its water courses and its farmlands. You devastate the people, you devastate their livelihoods, and you have give them virtually nothing in return. What do you expect? I mean, you, you are, you, 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 that's a time bomb, and that was what occurred because there's a lot of anger, and a lot of this, that anger, I would perhaps, is, um, is um, justified, you know, because what you leave them with no options. And for many years, that was the situation. Like I said, after that, after Kintaru and Mossop, all kinds of insurgent groups, rebellious groups, rebel groups, terrorist groups emerged. And that is what is occurring. Then during the, after a while, during the era of democracy, the Nigerian state and the government knew that they had to do something about it. They had to start to recompensate them. That's the, in the citizens of the Niger Delta, indigenous living within the Niger Delta. And so they started programs for training the youth, absorbing them, because a lot of them are taking up arms. Arms flooded the territory, and there were guns and all kinds of arms in the territory. They you know it was it become it was becoming utterly lawless. And so they had to convince them there was an amnesty to say, okay, put down your arms. We would train you, we would um, give you life skills to support yourself and your families and what have you. And they did, they did that for a while. So um, there was a program, a very important, um, quite a well-known program that we were by. A lot of um, the indigents of the uh, Niger Delta were taken to Ghana and other places to be trained, to acquire skills, all kinds of skills, so that they can become self-sufficient and they can disengage from um insurgent activities that went on for a while and and that perhaps to some extent it's arguably that might have curbed the agitations occurring in, in the niger delta um so that was what happened after the um military uh, dictatorship and when nigeria return to democratic rule. But another kind of scourge occurred um, in terms of Boko Haram. You know, um, Boko Haram and um, their in, um, beginnings are quite interesting too. The activity is quite different. And I, I bring this as a sort of to as a contrast to what occurred during um, the activity when Mossop was in its at its height as a as a as, as a social movement, a, a different kind of um, arrangement, a different kind of era, a different kind of dispensation occurred under Boko Haram. Boko Haram arrived in 19 was formed, likely said in in 19, 2009 under the leadership of, uh, no, sorry, 2002, rather, sorry, 2002, under the leadership of one Muhammadu Yusuf, who was killed by the Nigerian authorities in 2009. When he died, he was viewed as, um, you know, he, yeah, he, he's the founder of uh, Boko Haram. He was quite young when he was killed. Right? Um, but his followers, viewed him like a hero and he was well respected well he was um, mythologized and and you know and so even though he was killed in in flesh his spirit and what he stood for has continued to um, be felt not only in Nigeria but in other countries in the in, in, in towards the northern Eastern region of Nigeria, that which includes Cameroon, the Chad, and Niger, and beyond. Now, why did Boko Haram emerge? It emerged because um, there's uh, agitations for the Islamization of Nigeria. First, and the first, in fact, um, 
push for Islamization of Nigeria came from the political class, not from the underclass. It came from the political class during the era of military rule. How did this occur? In 19, 2003, um, Zamfara State, which is in north, um, northwestern Nigeria, uh, became an, a Sharia state that's, um, um, that's ruled under Islamic law. And Nigeria, mind you, is a, was, was supposed to be constitutionally a secular state. So that was seen as some sort of challenge. Nonetheless, nine other states, nine other states became Sharia states, that's yeah, rule on, of, under Islamic law, not minding the fact that Nigeria is supposed to be a secular state. So that occurred in 2003. 2002, I said Boko Haram was formed. 2009, the leader, Muhammad Yusuf, was killed. And then after that, Amadou Sekau became leader, who is still the leader of Boko Haram, of at least the fraction of Boko Haram. And Boko Haram as, means two things. First, it means, please, Ralph, if I'm talking too much, just uh, let me know in answer that. Sorry, I hope I, if I'm, uh, just prompt me, I, I, I mean, so that I know yes. um, how to, to, I know if I'm talking I, too much, you know. So that I, I, was about to send, I was about to send you a message just to give you a time, uh, a time warning. <laughs> okay. I think um, about... About seven seven minutes to uh, to wrap up, and that'll give fifteen minutes for discussion. So around around seven minutes. Okay, that's that's sufficient. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now, um, so Boko Haram, when um, the um, Muhammad Yusuf was killed in two thousand and nine, Abubakar Sekau took took over. Abu Bakr Sekau is quite different in terms of his approach, his personality, and modus operandi to Yusuf. Abu Bakr Sekau became quite um, brutal in how he pursued his um, objectives. He condoned and encouraged kidnapping kidnapping of, um, he condoned the use of young girls, as young as 10, 12, as suicide bombers. He attacked government install installations and, and, and people uh, yet when he could. Mostly he attacked a lot of innocent people. So the, 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 the spates of bombings in public spaces, in malls, in markets, Skyrocket, skyrocketed under his leadership of Sekau. And they started to make their demands quite, um, and quite, quite vocally. They started to be quite vocal in their, making their demands and making what they wanted to achieve known. And like I said, it, what they wanted to do was the, they wanted the rule of Allah um, to be instituted in Nigeria and beyond because they had international contacts. They had contacts in uh, strong ties in contacts in, in Libya, um, war torn Libya, in, in, in Mali, in Somalia, beyond in, in, in the Middle East, all over the Middle East, and, and, and they had links to the Taliban. So it, it was a, a transnational kind of vision and, and intent that they had. And they were quite like vocal and quite um, insistent in, in achieving their, their, their mission. And um, they, were, they were quite categorical in saying that they were anti-democracy, anti-polytheism, anti-atheism, anti-modernity, anti-technology, anti-innovation, anti so many things, anti-civilization as we know it today. And so 
it was difficult for them to win friends and sympathizers, even within the Northern Nigerian political class, which is largely Islamic. And because of their methods, you know, like I said, they were, they were, they, 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 they were they've been decapitation, decapitations of human beings, innocent you know, human beings. So, I mean, and, you know, and infidel, who they regard as infidels. And like I said, I, I, I mentioned that Boko Haram stands for two things. Boko means um, book, Western education, Haram is forbidden. And they wanted to institute the, the law of Allah within the entire country. That was their mission. And in doing so, the Nigerian state, the nation building project has been presently realized and pursued, had to be stopped, had to be halted. And that is what Boko Haram has stood for. And in so doing, it has pursued his its its uh, objectives in the most heinous, uh, the most violent manner, I should say, most violent manner, in kidnapping, or kind of kidnapping, um, in suicide bombings, decapitations of people, and so on, burning, raising of villages, farmlands, um, cattle rustling, everything. It was just, you know, utter. Um, chaos and lawlessness in trying to achieve its ob objectives. Um, that has continued, but later, late, lately there has been a splintering because I've also, you know, the, um, there was also tensions within the sect about how to treat mod moderate so-called, or, or yeah, moderate Muslims. That's Muslims who were not um, um, in agreement with, with their methods of, of violence. How do you treat them? Do we treat them as infidels? Do we treat them as um, a Muslim brothers? So that's a, that has led to a splintering of the sect into several, you know, all kinds of sects now, or, or multiple sects. So it's been actually become quite difficult to deal with Boko Haram because you are dealing with several sects and several and leaderships. Even though uh, Abubakar Shekau's um, um, fraction is still in existence, that is what has occurred, um, and this is occurring too in a time of democracy. Now let us link it to what happened during Ken Sarawua. Ken Sarawua stood for non-violence, and he was operating under military dictation, dictatorship. Now, isn't it an irony that? In, in an era of, 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 of democracy, freedom of exp expression, and all kinds of freedoms and human rights, a much more radical sect, a sect that says the entire Nigerian pro pro um, nation building project is false and should be discontinued, has become you know, it, 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 a, a much stronger challenge to the state has emerged. And this challenge is, is has uh, you know res immense resources of violence, and you know because they, they are very skilled fighters, they have contacts, they have international contacts, and this is occurring during the era of democracy, and you know um, that is what I find quite ironic, you know, I, quite ironic, which is a, a different kind of. Um, dispensation in terms of how the government, the government that exists, and then the social, the social political configuration that would allow for the emergence of a terrorist group that you know is quite insistent in changing the political status quo. Not only the political status quo, but the entire Nigerian um, configuration. Uh, the entire Nigerian state, as we know it, a state and nation, as we know it, you know I, that it should I, be discontinued, and it like and it should be continued. To, after being discontinued, the, the struggle to acquire some sort of transnational impact continues. So that that's what I find quite ironic about the change since. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sadia. Um, can I stop you there? <laughs> yes, okay. If you like, yeah, I'm just keeping an eye on the uh, on the time. But 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that very insightful and detailed sweep of that history. And um, I mean, I think a, a motif that stands out for me um, in in your account is is that of reflections. You know that you know reflections like in a mirror are both you know the same and also opposites. So when we talk about reflections, we can we can look at that way in which, uh, for example, the you know the violence of the military dictatorship led led to the rise of a violent opposition later on, and the way in which Ken Sarawiwa's nonviolence is you know mirrored in the opposite way in Boko Haram's violence, and the state itself has also reversed from a violent dictatorship to a nonviolent democracy. So there's so many themes of reflections and echoes, and you know I think mechanisms that also happen in other parts of the world, like the Middle East with Western intervention in the Middle East, that also gives rise to, you know, armed insurgents in that part of the world as well. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so in terms of taking questions, uh, Az Azar has got uh, is the first, first to have her hand up. So I'm going to ask you to unmute and um, let's hear from Azar. Um, thank you very much, Sanya, for the very, like, um, very nicely um, like composed uh, presentation. Um, so I want to start from your last uh, remark, like how are you, like, somehow strike by uh, militarism, uh, sorry, strike by um, democracy, that in the era of democracy, uh, a group like Boko Haram emerged, you know. And it just brought to my mind your argument in the book when you talked about militarism and how militarism is actually um, not necessarily the rule of military, but it's the continuity of um, that it's the continuity of uh, of uh, um, like the the military, the, the kind of military. I don't know. If it's Mentality, but the kind of the, milita the military um, uh, lifestyle or military way of life, you know. So it is somehow a continuity that goes beyond um, uh, beyond the ruling of the military, military itself. And and um, I wonder if if um, um, like if we look at at northern Nigeria, I always got the sense of North, northern Nigeria is somehow kind of a parallel state, you know, in, in Nigeria. And um, if if we look at how, um, like, the, the from the beginning, like, uh, the role of colonialism, because you talked about Western education, so that has to do with the role of colonialism who introduced Western education. And it brings us back to the argument that um, also uh, how colonialism shaped um, the idea of the, the, the federal state, you know, and how the federal state somehow intersects with militarism. And I mean, in the case of of, of Sarawiwa, we talked we talked about um, the ethnic minorities, but I think also in the case of northern Nigeria, we should also talked about religious minorities because we can't see northern Nigeria as one group of uh, like the same Islamic doctrine. So this is why I would say there is uh, some sort of um, 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 uh, religious minority. So in, 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 in the base of federalism, where you talked about this militarism and, and ethnicity, I would say in the case of Northern Nigeria, there's uh, federalism and military, uh, federalism that's somehow based with uh, religion. So what would you what would be your comment about that? How you respond to that? I can't see. The last part of your question, sorry. Uh, the last part of my question. Yes, is last part, yeah, yes. Yes, okay. thank, yes thank you. Because yeah, it, it, I like your comments. I, I, I see the sense because you're teasing out some very interesting connections. I, and I get the sense. Yeah, I do. So, but yeah. 
Yeah, but I, it's also a form of analysis. We, we, it's, it's not just a good question, it's an analysis which I, I agree with most of what you're saying, so yeah. Okay, but can you, can you just reframe the last part of your, of your, of your contribution, please? You'll have to unmute yourself, Azar. Um, yes, I mean, as I, the last part of, I mean, it was somehow a question of how would you respond to this whole idea of like Nigeria, like Northern Nigeria is a kind of a parallel state. So what is happening in, in Northern Nigeria is somehow um, triggered by the, the continuity of, milita of militarism, even after democracy. And also um, this uh, issue of, of religious minorities. You know. yeah. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting question. And it's quite true because you, it, um, it speaks to the issue of you, you refer to colonialism, you know, Colo Nigeria is a colonial creation, it wasn't created by Nigerians, and it wasn't meant for Nigerians, it was created for the colonial administration, for their purposes, and their purposes were not, were never in agreement with what Nigerians wanted or so, because Nigerians is a, if it's, yeah, it's a fabrication, and you do have, yes, I agree with you, you do have all those contradictions, those contradictions of minorities within the supposedly north, you know, which is supposed to be Islamic. Yes, you do have that. And those tensions that have been, they have been occurring actually for a long time there have become quite national in scope, you know, because we were ignoring it for a long time and they've been occurring for maybe, um, maybe almost 40 years or more about, in fact, no, much more, much longer. But it, they were not brought to the national um, reckoning, the national reckoning or national attention. It was all muted, you know, quite muted. But it was occurring, as you say. Now, because it's become, yeah, it's becoming much more visible and we can't ignore it. Because that same kind of um, contradiction has become quite national. I agree with you totally. I don't, you know, I, I agree with you totally. I agree with you. Too. It's a, it's a very insightful remark. I agree totally with what you say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I saw that Dom had a had a question here about uh, memorialization, and I've just asked you to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Sanya, for this presentation. Um, I was uh, I was very interesting when you, you you alluded to the processes of myth making concerning Boko Haram. And I was wondering if you could reflect um, on the memorialization of the, the man of peace of and, and um, his place in the, in the imaginaries of, of Nigeria. And if you could have a comparison between like the, um, the, the, the kind of um, charisma or um, legacy of the, of the charisma of, of the men of war and the men of peace. That is that is a very interesting question, and that is yeah. I, I think yeah, um, you know, it's it, it is the memorization or the uh, construction of the man of peace that is much more. I think it's very important and very necessary for for Nigeria to continue to survive or, or to have any meaningful existence. Yes, I and. But we have very few of that now. We have so few of that, we, you know, because it's like the um, we had a, there was a civil war in Nigeria from 1967 to 1970. Rather than the wounds haven't healed, they are still open, and then you have this um, problem of the Niger Delta. You have the problem of Boko Haram. So what and each each like it's it's, it's like each part of the country is is angered, agitated, angry, angry. And, and so, in fact, there are reports, international reports, surveys saying that it's a miracle Nigeria continues to exist, that they don't see it existing for much longer. So we actually, we do need this um, 
constructions of the man of peace uh, in the public consciousness to motivate us to greater heights, to greater um, free, uh, to greater um, uh, um, dispensations of peace and stability. But uh, but the contrary is that we have in you know men who are act actively uh, on trying to undermine the Nigerian building project who are. Angry, angry, agitated, and you know, so those are the dominant kinds of narratives we see within the public space, which is um, quite unfortunate, quite unfortunate. You know, but, yeah, but, uh, but we do need, you know, constructions of man of peace as a unifying symbol, as a symbol of transition and transformation. We do need those sort of symbols. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia and Dom. And I see a question from Monica, and you can unmute yourself. Hi. Um, my question is with regards to Sonia's last comment about the irony of how under democracy the terrorist groups have kind of emerged. I have a question. Do you think that if Nigeria was still under military leadership, the terrorist groups would emerge as much as they have emerged now? The, that, that's a uh, good question, very quite interesting. Um, the military were quite unaccountable. They were not. They weren't ac accountable in many instances, and in, in how they operated. You know, like you know, they were quite um, repressive in, in putting down opposition and dissent. That's one. But they were also doing something that has become, you know, a big, huge problem. There was a hollowing out of a state. So there was. So um, they were. There was. There was a plundering of, of national resources by all the generals in billions of dollars, which you know, from the Nigerian coffers. And what, what has that has done is that it has enfeebled the entity of a state. It has enfeebled the nation. So we don't have, the, the, uh, even them, if they, there was a military rule, still, they still wouldn't have a monopoly of, power, of violence and of force. So it is likely that a lot of insurgent groups too would have emerged because of their short-sightedness and because of the of the corruption that they were engaged in. They would they were undermining this, both the state and the nation because they were lawless, totally. They weren't accountable to anybody. They weren't accountable. So I I, I see I still see insurgent groups emerging because you know the state wouldn't have had a, a monopoly of violence. Yes, and uh, you you write about that in the um, the paper uh, that you circulated about that link between dictatorship and corruption, and how those two things feed off each other and and you know undermine the ability of the state. Yeah. We are at um, we're at six o'clock, and so I think that may be perfectly perfectly timed. So I feel like there's definitely more that could be uh, could be discussed, but um, if we're content to leave it there, then shall I uh, shall I wrap things up? Good. Okay. Sanya, thanks very much. Um, that's uh, that's really great to have to have uh, your presentation, and thanks everyone for taking part. Um, yeah, if you just want to, if you want to say uh, goodbye, Sanya, I've uh, I've asked you to unmute. And next week, Ralph, what do we have next week? Oh, yes, good, good, uh, good point. So we have uh, next week at the same time, uh, we have Rachel Adams on how uh, can, uh, can AI be decolonized? So if you uh, meet us back here at five o'clock next week, Thursday, we'll circulate um, the uh, flyer. And also if you look at the humor website, there's an events tab and that has the Zoom link and the information about next week's talk. So we look forward to having Rachel here next week so yeah thanks thanks to humor for hosting this series um as everyone who helped put this together thanks to thanks to uh, sanya thank you